Ready? Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is Al Vogel from the town of St. Albans, and I'll call the meeting to order. Can we please everybody introduce themselves? I'll start off with Bob. Bob Bierman from South Arrow. Matthew. Matthew Thor from Alberg, Vermont. Dan. I'm Rick Ferguson. Michelle. Oh, Michelle's our guest. Hold yeah. on, Michelle. I'll be right back to you. Okay. Uh, Peter. Peter Zamor, South Hero. Emily. Emily Clough, staff. Bill. Bill Irwin, Bakersfield. Thank you, Barkley. Berkeley is going to be five minutes late. Oh, okay. Um, so now, may I introduce Mich Michelle's the first, any change to the agenda? I guess that's the first issue. <laughs> Hearing or seeing none, we'll move on uh, to introduce Michelle. Michelle's our uh, guest speaker tonight, and she's going to talk to us about electricity and how to save some. Michelle, please introduce yourself and your goals of this meeting with us. Sure. So my name is Michelle McCutcheon Shore. I am the Community Engagement Manager for Efficiency Vermont. For those of you who are not familiar, Efficiency Vermont is the statewide energy efficiency utility. Um, and I have just a few slides to give you guys some background on what we're doing. Is, is this a good time to start sharing those or would you like me to do more of an introduction? Nope, I think that's perfect. And you should have the ability to share. Let me know if okay. it's haywire at all. And I'll totally own that I am terrible at Zoom because we have to use Teams. So we're going to test my Zoom skills is what we're going to do. You all would right. I think we would have all landed on one by now. It feels like we toggled between the two. Never. Can you all see a blue screen that says Efficiency Vermont Overview? Yes. Yep. Yes. Great. And I have shared these already with Marlena. I'm assuming you're comfortable. You can email them out afterwards. Maybe PDF them beforehand just because there are some in slides and stuff, but um, so let's see, there we go. Uh, I'm gonna go over a little bit who we are, who's Efficiency Vermont, some rebates, incentives and financing. I'll also give a quick overview of our flood recovery offers that we have right now um, and then how to get started working with us. I'm super comfortable being interrupted too. I can't, I don't know if I can see the chat, but Feel free to just pipe in with this small of a group. I don't mind if anyone wants to ask questions as we go along. Um, so as I said, we are the statewide energy efficiency utility. Um, we serve all of Vermont except for Burlington. We provide weatherization incentives to um, the whole state except for Vermont gas customers who receive weatherization incentives through Vermont Gas. So I will provide our incentives, but if you are a Vermont Gas customer, or I know, I'm assuming many of your towns are served by Vermont Gas, it's worth reaching out to them to hear more about their weatherization incentives. So we kind of have a five-tier approach to energy efficiency. We have rebates and incentives and financing. We do a lot of education, promotion, and one-on-one -on -one guidance. That's kind of where I sit. Uh, we have engineering and project support. Upstream, upstream supply chain management. So we have an entire team focused on the supply chain. This means making sure that we're getting the technologies that we need, working with the workforce to make sure we have the individuals that we need to, to execute the programming. And we work a lot on partnerships. It is really important that we do not work in a silos efficiency Vermont. We need to work with our partners on the ground, which is all of you, as well as distribution utilities like Green Mountain Power, the local municipal utilities that are part of FIPSA, all those things we need to all be together working at hand in hand if we want to reach our energy goals throughout the state. So we have rebates and incentives in both the residential and commercial space on things like air sealing and insulation, weatherization. Like I said, if you're a Vermont gas customer or your town is served by Vermont gas, those incentives would go through their program. Heating, cooling, and ventilation and water heating. This is mostly looks like heat pump, heat pump water heaters, advanced wood heating, um, appliances, smart and connected technology. So things like smart thermostats, um, and then for commercial in the commercial space, we have a lot of industry specific incentives, kitchen equipment, refrigeration, um, dairy production, those sorts of things. 
We also have income eligible offers, which I'll dive into a little bit more in the on an upcoming slide, and no to low interest financing. So income eligible services for households whose income, a, a larger portion of their income goes towards electricity, they may be eligible to receive free and reduced cost products through our um, low income services. These are mostly executed in partnership with our weatherization agencies, so people can call us to learn more and figure out if they qualify. These services include replacement of new appliances, if applicable, um, an energy spacement assessment of their space, new LED light bulbs and water saving devices installed on site. Um, and then if they use electricity help at home, they could actually, actually even qualify for a free ductless heat pump or heat pump water heater. So our comprehensive weatherization program, we have our residential home performance with Energy Star program. Right now, those are 75% of project costs up to $4,000. And for income eligible, um, so mostly moderate to low income Vermonters can receive 75% of project costs back up to 9,500. Building performance, this is for um, commercial spaces. We offer comprehensive weatherization, um, which most basically means that we are looking for a certain amount of energy savings out of the weatherization work. They need to work with an ENN contractor or energy efficiency network um, contractors to receive 75% of project costs back up to 5,000. And um, both, both programs, you have to work with an ENN contractor. I should have said that with the residential program. I apologize. Um, we have three different financing options available right now. Pretty much anyone can access the home energy loan if our lenders qualify them. Um, these can start at 0% interest based on your income. And there's no limited loan amount. It can finance up to $20,000. Or if you're looking at flood rebates, which I'll talk about in a little bit, can go up to 30,000. And projects can include weatherization, heat pumps, heat pump water heaters, wood heating systems, and energy star appliance replacements. You're also allowed to use this for health and safety reasons that are related to the project. So like, let's say you have water in your basement that needs to be dealt with before you replace your heating system. You can finance that through this loan program. It cannot be a separate project outside of the energy efficiency project, but if it is needs to be done prior to the energy efficiency project done, you can finance through this. Um, the weatherization repayment assistance program is a program that we are executing through participating utilities. You'll see them down there, BED, Green Mountain Power, Ludlow Electric, Vermont Electric Co-op, and VGS. To participate in this program, you do need to work with a participating um, contractor. And this is focused on heat pumps and weatherization. And the idea is that an individual can do weatherization and heat pumps and then pay it back on bill financing through their utility. This is a relatively new um, program um, that we just got up and running. So not many people have heard about this, but definitely trying to get the word out. And then we have our business energy loan, um, which are low interest loans with zero dollars down to start. Um, the VCSEU is the one participating lender for this. The other two programs, um, again, the weatherization repayment assistance program is through your utility and the home energy loan has a few other participating lenders. The business energy loan is through VCSEU with a $50,000 cap and flexible loan terms. And I'm doing a really quick overview of all of this. I wasn't sure what level everyone knew. I can go back and talk about any of this and I also can send you guys more information afterwards. We currently are um, providing flood recovery offers for across the state. So this is a separate contract with the state outside of our standard energy efficiency um, contracts because there's a lot of people out there that need to do a lot of work. So we have offers for homeowners and tenants, rental property owners, commercial, and also a bonus program for contractors. Again, I know this is a little bit of a word soup. I'm not gonna dive into all of this. Needless to say, there's a fair amount of money out there up to $10,000 for homes to replace heating systems um, and uh, hot water heaters and appliances. Same thing for rental property owners. Um, commercial, it's pretty open-ended because we know commercial loss a variety of different equipment. That is $4,000 per product that someone replaced. So like say someone replaced a 
um, kitchen equipment, refrigeration, a heating system, they can get a max of another $4,000 on top of our standard incentives for an additional $16,000 potentially on those equipment that were, they replaced from the flood. Across the board, this has to be new and efficient equipment. It cannot be refurbished or used equipment. Excuse me, sorry. Um, so our Energy Excellent Network, this is the network that I talked about a little bit under our incentives. This is a network of 482 members currently um, that provide services across the state that are needed in order to execute people's projects. So this is weatherizations, contractors, electricians, plumbers, you name it. They participate in our network. We uh, offer training. They are required to have a certain certifications based on what they're the type of work that they do, the certification requirements are different across the network, but we try to make it so that enrollment is fairly easy for them. However, we want some standard of service uh, for those who are tapping into them. For many of our incentives, you need to use the EEN uh, contractor in order to access them. Again, we're trying to ensure that the work that is being done is done with a qualified and insured contractor. Um, DIY is great, but it can be severely problematic for a lot of homes, um, and it's really hard for us to have quality insurance when it's when it's done by an individual that maybe doesn't have the proper training or certifications. So how we get started, really there's a whole bunch of different ways we try to meet customers where they're at. You can do everything from just calling us to ask us a question to scheduling a virtual home energy visit. We also have similar offers to the commercial space. You can find a pro and start, if you already know what project you wanna do, you can go to the Find a Pro tool and talk to a contractor and get quotes and see where you're at. Um, we have a online shop that lists qualifying products. Um, and if you are impacted by the flood or know someone who has been, they can reach out to us at customer service or go to our flood rebate page. And we have an entire resource page, knowing that a lot of you do outreach or interested in outreach. We have a page where partners can go and download our materials and print them themselves. You also can always reach out to me and I'm happy to mail you some things if you have an event or anything like that coming up. If you aren't already, I highly encourage you to sign up for our newsletters. We have three of them. What's new is like our residential statewide um, newsletter. This goes out to, I think over 5,000 people get it at this point. Um, just tells you any update, anytime an incentive change, we send those out. Business solutions, it's mostly focused on the commercial space. And then the EVT Insider is actually the newsletter that I help oversee. That's really focused on providing our partners with information that they need to do outreach or speak with customers on our behalf. Um, we really try to make sure that we put in partner information in there. So we will sometimes give you summaries of surveys that we do or behind the scenes things that we're doing out in the field and what we're seeing and hearing from customers to try to bring everyone along on that journey. And I think that's it. This is my contact information. Um, I put my Gmail account. That was silly. I meant to write, I have the same email. It should be vxc.org. I will fix that before we send this out. Um, but I'm going to stop sharing if I know how. Um, let's see. And see if there's any questions. Questions, anybody? Matthew, go Ma ahead. Matthew? Matthew? Yes, I do have a question, you know, about... About this, you know, uh, surveys, you know, how frequently do you do surveys? Because data is a big issue across the state in my work. And most people are very upset that Vermont's behind the ball of, you know, gathering data or lack of resources of people to do this type of data. So I'm wondering, you know, how fresh is this data and how often should we be doing these type of data sets to reach out to outreach engagement, but also internally within Vermont's efficiency network on the utilities prospects of their surveys too as well. Utilities gotta do surveys too as well to be able to understand the whole mechanism as a whole. So like I said, that's a big question right there. And how updated is it kept up? Is this a live data? Pretty much is this gonna be a live document survey that you, we take 
every three months or every year so we can get a bigger picture of where what we're doing now, what we're doing next, and what we're going to do in the future. Thank you. So our residential survey happens every year. Um, it is very much focused, though, on what Efficiency Vermont does, what customers are experiencing with us. We really want to know if our incentives are making a difference if our customer service team is providing them with the information they need, that sort of thing. We also provide data to the regional planning commissions every year. Um, these are usually about a year behind because it takes us about six months to get full data sets on the performance of all of our programs, as well as energy saving data from the utilities. So the utilities will send us very high level uh, energy usage by town and then we compare it in past years. Um, but that, we usually update that in June um, for the previous year. So it's like a year behind. And then the residential survey happens yearly. Other questions? Okay, yeah, this is Bill. Um, yes, Bill. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, nice presentation. And I, I believe I caught that we're going to get, send a copy of that after you change your email Fix my email that was really embarrassing <laughs> sorry everyone oh, Tell it's funny. like the day before a holiday <laughs> right <laughs> yeah and thanks to everybody attending tonight for the week before christmas yeah um i, I wanted to <clears throat> get a did you have a sense of how many vermont or maybe we say vermont residential households, commercial entities, and other categories of, of Vermonters that could use your services do. I'm just trying to get a sense as to whether that is a measure of how effective your incentives are or other elements of maybe marketing of, of it or maybe where we might even help at the Regional Planning Commission? Um, wow, I don't know that I have any data of like, this is how many Vermonter, this is how many residential homes there are and how many have uh, taken on our services. It is, it's way more difficult than I think anyone realizes to like count homes, right? Like even just saying like how many residential buildings or spaces are in this particular area is is low. We do know that uptake is the highest among homeowners, um, particularly moderate income and those who are a bit older. Um, young homeowners tend to be less likely to take up services. We don't, for anecdotally from my experience, I do think that's partially because when you first buy a home and you're young, like you might not have the money to invest in it, or you just don't have the time, particularly if you have a younger family to navigate contractors and it's a lot of work on the homeowner. Right. Um, so there's, there's that, uh, we know that rental units are the least likely to take up our services. And that is an effort, honestly, I'm taking on the next few years is really looking at how we make any traction in the rental property space it is extremely difficult it's not just difficult for me it's difficult across the country it's a conversation everyone's having particularly as rental units are climbing and home ownership is declining across the country um, and we know that is very much the trend in vermont as of right now um we know there's a lot of work to do in weatherization um heat pump yeah, weatherization and heat pumps, I would say, is the two areas that we have the most focus on. We've done a lot in lightings and lighting control um, and um, control work in general, but replacing heating systems is a very slow process. People don't usually replace their heating systems. They usually do it once every 10 to 12 years. You got to catch them in the right moment. They need to not be in an emergency, frankly, because if you're switching your heating system, you're usually going to have to do additional work to your home, either ducting or cut a hole in it if you're doing a heat pump. So a lot of times people don't replace their systems until they're failing. And then in that moment, they don't have the time to switch their systems. So I don't know that I'm answering your question 
spot on. Um, but hopefully it's giving you a sense of, of where the work needs to be done. Peter, and, I'll get to you in a Go on, Bill, excuse me. Oh, I was just gonna say, you're, you're doing a good job, Michelle. I understand the challenges as you started your com uh, response. And I hope that maybe we'll be able to do something a little bit better because I, I, I do think it's important you folks are unique in that you're an utility that is given certain uh, privileges, I guess you might call them, as a utility by the Public Utilities Commission, the state, the legislature, the Public Service Department, and um, probably uh, throughout some other even tax advantages, I don't know. But uh, for, for us to get a sense of how that's going is important because I think you're really valuable. And it might even be that we're not investing enough in what Efficiency Vermont is doing. And that might be something that we could do from the regional uh, planning side. Obviously that's what we're working on here is a piece of our regional plan we call the energy plan and we want to try to find solutions. And if you're not as accessible as we would hope it could be, and you're valuable as I just expressed, what are some things that we might be able to do to uh, increase that uh, accessibility and, and get that value that you do represent? Thank you. Yeah, and I again, the regional planning commissions get yearly counts of uptake of our programs, so at least you have that. The percentage question is the part that we struggle with. So we can certainly give you participation data broken down by town and regional planning. We avoid doing percentages because getting up to date housing counts is extremely difficult. Like I know even towns struggle with that, right? Like people could be cutting their houses into duplexes or taking their duplexes and going into one unit and they're supposed to register that, but zone enforcement is minimal across the state. So totally can give you counts um, by town. Giving it to you as percentages is where I would struggle. Michelle, Michelle, I think you might look at uh, the um, ANR and the span numbers, they can, the Act 250 can tell you pretty much where every house is and on what development it's in. So I think somebody in your organization could link to um, ANR, the board, Natural Resource Board. They might be able to help you identify how many houses there are in the state of Vermont. And I can also send that report around. I actually just pulled it up from last June. Um, and it, while it doesn't have that percentage, it has really interesting, valuable data. So I can include that um, in in kind of all of this follow up email that I will send, um, so everyone can kind of take a deeper look at that. Yeah, thanks, Marlene. That's a great idea. Um, um, Michelle, Peter. Peter? Yeah, <clears throat> I really agree with uh, Bill's question that information about the percentage of uptake would really be important. My question is, how is um, uh, Efficiency Vermont funded? We are funded by two main streams, I would say. One is um, the energy efficiency electricity charge on everyone's bill. Like, again, it, with the exception of Burlington Electric. So throughout the state, when people pay their electric bill, there is a percentage and it's it, residential, oh God, don't quiz me on the, what it is. I can look it up off the top of my head, but residential has a set amount and then commercial scales based on the size. That all goes into a fund to the Public Utility Commission. The Ut Public Utility Commission then passes it along to us to execute our program. So that is our electric efficiency charge funding. That is like the bulk of our funding. There is other revenue streams that have come in over the years to help fund weatherization which is our, any of our thermal program is a more accurate statement of that. So some of that has come through as um, Reggie funds when Reggie existed. Some of that has come through the state participating in the Ford capacity market and the revenue from that. Most recently, we have been awarded funds through the American Rescue Plan to execute weatherization program. 
those funds were distributed not only to us, but also the weather adjacent assistant programs, the WAPs across the state, um, and a few other miscellaneous weatherization programs, um, which I don't have the whole list, but there were, I think, about 12 people that were received ARPA funds around weatherization. Thanks. It's really great to see that your value is being recognized in uh, by other businesses or, or, or organizations. Yeah, thank you. Um, Michelle, Barkley Morris here. I believe at our last meeting, we had a discussion, Bill and I kind of got into it, as to to meet the state goals. I think you guys need to stretch a little bit further. And one of the things we discussed is if a person has a system that's aging, but has not yet failed, and I'll use myself as an example, I'm, I'm pretty sure I won't meet the income guidelines. Um, I burned 187 gallons of oil to heat a 2000 square foot house last summer, along with um, three cords of wood. It's not economically sensible for me to change my um, oil boiler out at this point and spend the amount of money it's going to cost me to go to a heat pump. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a large number of upper middle class, older homeowners that are pretty much in the same boat that I am. Um, you need to think about trying to stretch some incentives to get people whose systems are aging and I'll admit my boiler is 23 years old. It's cast iron, so it should last, but eventually it, it's gonna die. Human nature, I'm gonna wait until it starts to get real cranky before I do it. And it may turn out to be a January emergency. Um, and I don't think your TV ads reach that population at all. And, and honestly, I'm not sure if your TV ads really reach anybody. You, you could, look at some new marketers um so you know where do we where do we go how do we how do we pick up more people to try and catch up with the state legislature's goals which my understanding is is that we are way way behind them already um well that's a meaty question um but i will start off by saying um that the way that Efficiency Vermont is regulated, we are to design our incentives based on some very complicated calculations in the back end regarding dollar spent kilowatt hours, right? So every dollar we spend, we are supposed to have an average of a certain amount of kilowatt hours saved across the board. Truthfully, residential projects are not very cost effective when you look across the board that way. Residential programs in general tend to be very expensive for us to run if you look at our cost effective goal that way versus a commercial project. So there's a, I think it's like, it's about for every kilowatt hour, it takes us about a thousand dollars on average, like with the homeowner where you like swap that for, um, commercial like it's 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 like it's within the tens to 20 times the cost savings to do commercial projects we know we have to do residential projects we have requirements on us that require us to serve customers across the state but i hear what you're saying and you're not wrong i'm not saying you're wrong but with the way that we're regulated we are pushed to spend dollars based on a cost of saving a cost effective saving metric which requires us to not overspend based on kilowatt hours saved and you could i i i'm i am not here to debate whether or not that is right or wrong that is just the truth behind how we're regulated it makes everything makes a lot more sense knowing that now yeah yep yeah um and so, it's okay go ahead i have um two questions many years ago and i at least three to five years ago through your program, I got two Nest thermostats. Mm -hmm. I just got notice from Nest that they're discontinuing. Okay. And yeah. I don't, I don't even know how, how, what to do about it or how to uh, get on, get to something else that allows me to control my house when I'm away from it. 
That's one question. What do you mean Ness is con discontinuing? Like they're not going to be existing anymore? Ness? That's, right. that's, a, that's the way I read the notice. Okay. It's totally worth calling our customer service team and you can get an engineer on the phone to talk about what system you... I, I don't know enough about that to answer. I am not a technical person. <laughs> I okay. will be totally honest. But you can totally call us. We have plenty of engineers that can help you out on, with one-on-one -on -one questions like that. In these types of forums, it's super hard to dig into people's like homes. And again, it's it's not me. There's other people right. that can help okay. you with that. The second question I have is, is not so much, I don't know whether it's regulatory, you can even issue it. But when you said you work with the various electric companies, this is not going to save, so to speak, um, electrons but my thought was no that i'm not i'm unaware of any company i get uh, my electricity from the uh, co-op that i do all my laundry and drying late at night mm -hmm. and in some cities you get a discount because you're not you're off the high peak mm -hmm. and our utilities aren't doing that wouldn't that be to the advantage of some whether you can advocate with the electric companies they, I'm on, they don't even come to my house anymore. They read the meter electronically. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that they could also know when I'm using electricity. I do get my, my calculus on how I'm using electricity. Why can't they have rates different for different times of the day? So they have been playing around with that for electric vehicles. There, It actually takes, it, it, there's a large cost to monitoring electricity that way. You need very complicated software that frankly never works as well as it's supposed to work. If they're not placing special meters or some other tool at your home to moderate it. So electric vehicles, they're able to do it because they put, when you buy an electric vehicle charger, that is the system that's monitoring it to know when you're using it. Doing it off a smart meter, I don't know enough off of, I don't know enough about smart meters to know what would it take to do that, but I just know with, electric vehicles, they need a separate unit to do that. So with GMP, and I'm speaking from my personal experience, like I get charged just a lower rate for charging my car at night than I do at, at during the day. I don't know Vermont Electric Co-op's rates well enough for their programs well enough to know if they do that as well, but it's certainly a discussion across the board. Again, though, like resident, as much as to you, that feels like a lot of electricity, it's not in the broad stream of things in your home. And so a lot of times those time of use rates, those that technology is invested in much larger energy users. I'm not saying residential is not important, but again, when you're looking at investments, there's a lot of people who feel like, oh, well, not enough is happening in my home, which is fair. But when you're talking about these big changes, they don't tend to happen in the residential spaces because dealing with individuals' homes is very expensive. It's very time consuming and it, it takes a large uplift. Um, so my point of saying that is it may not be happening now, but it's certainly a discussion that's happening across the state constantly. And it probably will come down to the residential space because it's certainly happening on the commercial end. Well, I've been, um, was involved in rate design, so-called, um, when I was in private practice. And I can tell you that there is a customer understanding perspective that is very important. I remember um, someone from the Vermont Low Income Advocacy Council, which is probably not around anymore, that had a devastating campaign about a cost her $75 to do a load of rot wash because she was misinformed as to when on peak and off peak was. The other point is that it's the Department of Public Service that really has their, their controls on the knob of rate design, just as they do on uh, revenue requirements. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Peter. That was a much better answer than me. <laughs> I'll throw in one piece. I was actually involved with the Vermont Electric Co-op study where I had a they, they gave me an in-house monitor and and did the incentives for the rates for, I think I did it for a year. Um, so they, they did a fairly widespread study. As a result of that, they haven't gone and expanded it to across the board, mm -hmm. at least not yet. Right. I mean, I know a lot of, I don't know, if, I would assume Vermont Electric Co-op, but there's certainly definitely utilities across the board that are still working to get smart meters into people's homes because you need pretty good connectivity for them to even operate. And we all know the issues with like Wi-Fi access across the state. So yeah, there's still- I think the co-op was one of the first companies to do it. And I think that just about their entire um, area 
has been smart. Well, the, it, it was it, it was it was it was a, a a read meter only though. It wasn't actually an hourly monitor. So this process I went through was a by minute monitor that they could track exactly what was going on in my house the whole time. Um, Are you guys all in bit... the co-op? Are most, most of your towns on a Vermont electric co-op? Yeah. Oh, okay. Al County is entirely co-op. Uh, yeah. Most of Franklin County as well. Yeah, it is, Matthew. Yes, it's true. Vermont uh, electric co-op has control of both some of Franklin County and most of Grand Isle County. Thank you. And then the remainder is GMP, and we have two um, local utilities, Enosburg and Swanton. Mm -hmm. Reg, so I miss Reg and Swanton. <laughs> he's my buddy. He's doing so many events with Reg. I was so sad when he retired. Anyway, sorry. Go ahead, Phil. Everybody that gets to know Reg loves him. You know. So um, one of the reasons that I think we wanted to have you come, and again, we really appreciate it, is we're, we're looking at a lot of data for the regional plan in an effort to help our communities and the residents in our communities with a regional energy plan. And that data helps us understand what is the current production by various means of energy and uses and how are they balanced and, and how are they balanced, especially relative to uh, sustainable portions of supply versus fossil fuels? And I wondered if you could characterize what data Efficiency Vermont is supplying to the regional planning commissions for the energy plans. And, and might be Marlena can help with that too, because She's obviously using it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so our data that we provide is based on participation in our program. Um, so we, you know, that is also another gap I will say in the data is that a lot of people do things on their own. And like I said during my presentation, in order to participate in our programs, you need to use a contractor, a, a EEN contractor. So there are people that order, you know, heat pumps and install them themselves. And so then they're not going through our program. So this is simply counts of who's participating in our program. That's the best we can give you. And then again, we get aggregated data from the utilities that says this area was using this much energy and then we can track the energy savings based on what they were giving us. We do not purchase or distribute electricity. So we do not provide data nor are we able to really on um, the the spread of how that electricity is being generated that really can only be provided through the utilities. Um, I know there's been a lot of talk at the state, particularly with the PUC, on providing better data um, across the board. I don't know, frankly, where those conversations are at. There used to be the EAN tool, um, and I know they're working on the uh, Energy Action Network dashboard. I know they're looking at revamping that. Um, but it's yeah, I don't I don't really know when it's going to be out. So we at least can tell you who's participating in our program and the changes in electric use across your territory. The one caveat I always give people is that with a lot of our things that we want to see happen, there's an increase in electricity, right? So if if you want people to switch to a heat pump, a heat pump water heater in a an electric vehicle, they're energy their electric energy use is going to go up and our unregulated fuels um you know mainly propane and uh oil are not tracked in the same way that electricity is and so i get this question all the time why does it look like we have no energy savings when our project counts are high and it's because well those energy savings may be transitional but unless we go down to like the home level and say, how much cordwood were you buying? How much oil were you being delivered? How much propane were you being delivered? That sort of thing. We have no ability to really change that, uh, to track that, except for the case with natural gas, because that's so highly regulated and we can see those differences. You, you really make some great observations and points there. And we've been thinking about a lot of those too. For example, your, your point about 
the increasing need for electricity, but the limited growth in quantities of electricity supply. And obviously we depend a lot on hydro from Quebec and uh, even uh, some outside of the state nuclear. And yet we also get a lot of fossil for our big transmission supplies of electricity. But um, we're trying to incentivize a lot of the um, more distributed sources of energy production like solar and wind and maybe even um, geothermal, et cetera. So trying to get a, a sense of all of that, it seems like it's only the public service department that really is keeping track of that data. And Marlena, is that where we can get some of that information? Yeah, you're speaking about the generation data. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think okay. this has been really helpful to hear from Efficiency Vermont. I'd like to, if, if we could, at some point, see if we could get somebody from public service to come in and really help us understand. We have a lot of this policy that says we're going to do this with electricity, but are we actually able to supply what's needed if we make all these changes? when our mix, as um, we know it, is um, maybe not keeping up with that. The other, have you, have any of you read or looked at the energy burden report? The what? The energy burden report. No. So, um, I'm going to put it in the chat. I think this link will, I'm going to actually just put the link to the main page, but um, I'm going to share my screen again. So, the energy burden report. Can you guys see like a table? Oh, here you go. Can you see a table right now? Yes. Yep. Okay. So um, the energy burden report is a report that we put out approximately every three to four years. And um, it maps, and I'm sorry for the scrolling right now, but it maps energy burden, thermal, um, electrical, and um transportation by town. We actually this year also broke it down to census level. Energy burden, for those who don't know, is like the percentage of someone's income that is being spent on energy. Nationally, this is usually measured by thermal and electric. We add transportation because we know transportation is the largest cost in Vermont and the largest energy user. Um, the reason I think particularly this will be helpful to you. One, if we do layer in a lot of census data here. Um, we try to pull in some information from across the board. Again, some of these dates from this conversation might not be as up to date as you would like us to see, right? Like this is capping out in 2021. Go Could ahead. you make that a little larger? I can try. Is that better? Much okay. better, thank you. Yeah, no worries. Um, so this is like, this is just one, there's a lot of tables in here. Um, this is one of transportation, the greatest burdens of transportation across the state by town. Um, we have these for electric, thermal, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but what I think is very helpful, and because I'm a nerd, cool, uh, is this Appendix A, which is looks at different measures that people can take um, and their relative... Um, lifetime savings and reduction in energy burden, right? So these are like installing a thermostat to replacing a shower head to appliances to comprehensive weatherization. And you will see the biggest numbers are down here in transportation. This is where those, those big cost savings, those big reduction in energy use are really seen. Um, and I guess heat pumps are pretty, pretty high up there as well. But I think if you guys are really looking at what are the biggest bang for our buck, or even, you know, I always say, well, these low cost measures kind of maybe don't have those big numbers attributed to them. These lead to bigger actions, right? Like this is the stuff that people need to do to start understanding and feeling more comfortable to the, to the bigger actions. Yeah, this, this is rich data. This is, I think, what we need to add to our regional energy plan is how can 
ordinary folks actually gain from the changes in technology and even uh, some of the things that they can plan for. You know, Barkley, you were talking about your boiler replacing it. Here's here's a great table to share with you that if you change that to heat pumps, you, you may actually save a very significant amount. That's what I hope we can share with people rather than just kind of policy, which is oftentimes really not reality. So I just put the chat into the main page um, for the energy burden report. Um, we also have links in there so that you can download data from there as well as um, I'll put this in here, an interactive map of that. Um, you know, and another place that I think is worth mentioning is one of the biggest gaps, one of the biggest issues that we are facing in meeting any of these goals is the workforce to execute the efforts. There's a lot of money coming into the state right now to address workforce. Some of it, which we are um, working with the state on, we, we, we are sub recipients on some of those grants, but we're not the main recipients on any of those grants. Um, but we truly do not have the workforce needed in order to meet our goals. Even if we, like, I've heard this before, like efficiency Vermont should just get rid of everything that they're doing and just throw all their money towards doing free weatherization. I'm like, if we did that tomorrow, it wouldn't really matter because we do not have the workforce to execute that, that work. And frankly, you can't just show up at someone's house and be like, I'm going to weatherize your house for free. And they're going to be like, yeah, sure. Sounds great. But <laughs> that's the well, point. So another good point, Michelle. Thank you. I, I think Al has talked about this a lot, that we should in this region, let alone our state, try to build education programs that make environmental solutions good energy solutions, a part of the economy that drives Vermont. And it starts with people learning how to do things that then can do it in their communities, mm -hmm. make a living on it and save money. I think those are, again, some of the things we wanna add in this regional energy plan is it's not just as Al said, counting electrons. It's building the entire infrastructure required to change a very cold state into a place where it's easier to make it warm. Yeah. And anyway, I think a worthwhile activity is like, if you're gonna like look through your towns, look through the Energy Action Network, I mean, sorry, the <laughs> EEN Network, and see how many contractors are serving your town. Are you like, oh, there's only one weatherization contractor that this entire town can actually access? Maybe I need to do some outreach to someone who I know is doing weatherization and see it. Like we're offering free trainings. We're always interested in getting more people. BPI uh, Building Performance Indicate um, Institute has the certification that we require of contractors. If someone's already out doing that work, but they're not participating in our program and just need to get certified, we usually can help them do that. We are very very invested because we know this is frankly the biggest gap out there is getting more contractors on board who can do the work and do it in a way that is safe and reliable for homeowners sorry go ahead i'm going on my soapbox i'll be quiet now matt <laughs> well part of the problem is um there aren't enough in construction contractors for yep. the amount of work needed across the board, regardless of whether they're doing energy efficiency or not. Most of the reputable contractors I know, I'm, I'm a retired one, um, they're booking a minimum of a year out. And yeah. in addition to the um, labor issues, from what I've been informed, especially at the um, electrical production level, um, utility level, um, there's still some really serious supply chain issues uh, if if everybody on my street buys an electric vehicle, 
my understanding is is that um VEC will then be replacing every transformer down the length of the street. Um and and manpower is an issue too, but but getting the supplies as well. Um and and for a lot of us, I have my house is 25 years old and was geared towards less electricity rather than more electricity. Mm -hmm. So to go to a heat pump, my panel's basically full. I will replace the panel because the entry cable is sized, sorry, little bug, sized on the size of the breaker in the panel. I replace my entry cable back through to my meter um, and the power company will probably be re changing out my um, transformer if I put an electric vehicle in my garage at the same time. Um, so, yeah. so there, just there is a there is a snowball effect as well. Sure. Um, so on the transformer thing, that was very much the case that you couldn't get them during COVID. I have not heard of that still being an issue. Um, when I just needed to do one for a electric transit bus project, it took us like three weeks to get. So I don't think that is as backed up as it used to be. Um, and there is conversations that we and other partners are having with the Public Utility Commission about designing incentives for panel upgrades because we know that is a problem. I can make no promises or when or if or that will happen. But right now, panel upgrades do not fall into any category around like energy savings, but we know that is a huge barrier. So those discussions are happening with how politics and regulatory work, no promises of how that will go, but um, we know it's an issue for sure. Thanks. Matt, you had your hand up for a while. Yes, and let's get back to the workforce agenda. <clears throat> yes, you know, it depends on, you know, I know, what I see across the state within my works, and it's not just equity work, but what I see is, you know, how can we attract people if we're using the same traditional learning method, methodology, basically college degrees, and, you know, we're getting to complex, heavy stuff. But what if you're like me? I'm going to use myself as an example. I'm autistic. I have autism. I, I learn things differently and do things differently. Should I be what you call the traditional mindset of Vermont, you know? or be forced to take a traditional mindset of teaching, which meaning, should I be forced to learn Vermont's way, or should I learn it in my own term, in my way of looking at the system? And that's what we're facing today or across my work is, not everybody here in this group, you know, is young. We have a demographic, aging demographic across Vermont statewide. And if we were telling like a senior citizen, a veteran, uh, about complex work or complex stuff you're talking about, they won't be able to get it the first time. It just, you know, in a workforce, you know, hireability is looking for people, partnership, you know, to be able to help out with Department of Labor is also trying to reach out for any, you know, workforce opportunity. It's how we, in the workforce of Vermont, it's how we attract people. It has to work for the individual too as well. That learning that education, that tools, resources have to work for the individual because that's the one way they'll be able to be more efficient across the state and efficient in their work if it works for them, not against them. Thank you. I couldn't agree more. We, um, in our current workforce development grant with the uh, Office of Economic Opportunity, we have looked at how do we attract quote unquote, non-traditional workforce to become weatherization contractors. Um, and we've been working with Champlain Community Services, um, senior advocacy groups, um, uh, refugee and asylum seeker groups, looking across the board and asking the question of like, what do people need in terms of support to transition into a new career, but also start their own business? Because we also know for a lot of people who may be of of different demographics, they might not be comfortable going and working for another business that doesn't reflect them. And so we really want to focus on how do we stand up their own businesses so that they can be their own bosses and be more comfortable. When I, I always tell the story, when I was in my 20s, I got a grant through the um, Vermont Agency of Transportation to help stand up a um, 
uh, workforce development program around CDL drivers because we were in the CDL, we still are a CDL crisis. And we trained up all these women to become CDL drivers, particularly women of color. We threw them out into the workforce and none of them lasted more than like a month because they were faced with such racism and sexism from their colleagues that they didn't want to do the work. And it, I mean, I was 27 at the time. <laughs> I've learned a lot in the, the years I've been doing this of like, oh yeah, that was probably a terrible model to tell, you know, a woman that maybe has limited English, who's gone through trauma, who doesn't look like her colleagues, like go and just work for this construction crew as a CDL driver with not the comprehensive social services or frankly, the training for her colleagues of how to, how to welcome her in. And not to say that can't be successful, it doesn't mean that everyone has that attitude, but it it is shown to be much more successful if you stand people up and having their own businesses to be able to do this type of work. Marlene, if I could just jump in briefly, we've spent the last 15 minutes focusing on a lot of little factoids that lead to one issue, which is how realistic are these targets? And I understand that having high goals is great for creating enthusiasm, but in any major business and in, in private business, you got to have budget, you've got to have contingencies, you've got to have percentages, likelihood. And I wonder whether there's any of that inherent in what the legislature does in setting these targets, because we're just screwing ourselves into the ceilings to meet a target. And who knows whether we're going to meet it, because there are all these constraints. I'm a cynic. I apologize. No, Peter, I, I really appreciate your saying that because I think it's probably been obvious in so many of the things I say. I feel like we need to be more um, objectionable to a lot of the status quo because it's just not working. We've been fighting the energy battle for decades and we really need to do it in a more effective manner, which is holistic. It's 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 a very complex thing, creating energy for use in electricity that makes things run in heat, that makes a cold place warm or hot place cool, et cetera. And just creating targets is inadequate. We need to focus on what are the collection of changes that need to be made across the whole of community. And a lot of it's going to not only benefit energy, but it's very likely to benefit a variety of other important things for our regional planning. That's why I, I, I really try to, while we're trying to support the state, I'd like our state to do better at this. And I don't think just saying yes, 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 is going to get the state to do better. Um, all interesting points. I do want to call out that it is 7.30. I think you are yeah. supposed to have other agenda items other yes. than me. As much fun. This has been fun, guys. I do a lot of these, and this has been great. I'm just going to say I'm, all, I'm happy to come back anytime because these have been great conversations. Um, so thank you. Um, and thank you. My thank you email is in the chat along with the energy burn-in links. Um, Marlene, I think I have everyone's emails from the from the meeting invite you gave me, I'm happy to fix the presentation, PDF it and send it out. And I also can send out the, the links to the energy burden report, if that's helpful. That can you be... do that for all of us, Marlena? Say that again? Can you do that for all of us or do we need to individually? No, 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 no absolutely. Just saying, I'll just send it to everyone, it yeah. Whether it's me or Michelle, we'll get it up to all yeah. of you. Yeah, and then if you can provide the most recent data to them, that would be great. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Michelle. We appreciate it. No problem. Again, I'm happy to come back anytime. Um, and I hope everyone has a good holiday. Thanks. You Thanks. Also. You too. Thank you. You, you have been one of the more enlightening guests which this committee has had. Oh, very... thank you. I'm glad. I'm glad I didn't put anyone to sleep. Sometimes these meetings <laughs> late at night. <laughs> like, tried to keep my presentation short. <laughs> All right. Bye, everyone. Bye.
Melina, you're on. Sounds good. Okay. Let me share the presentation. So, so this is a kind of preliminary um, suggestion of what our new targets could look like. So um, I'm going to show you what our old targets look like. And then Emily and I spent some time kind of, I mean, it, in this exact vein of our targets don't feel realistic. And while we still have to, you know, meet a pretty high level when it comes to targets, we did some shifting around to try and make them feel more realistic in terms of where the growth was placed. Um, so feel free to um, ask questions as I go through. It It's going to be a relatively short um, presentation, and then we can discuss. Why is this not moving? Um, I think you're so not in presentation mode. We're seeing like all of the. You're exactly right. I have my whole Zoom thing is messed up right now. Okay. I can't move the little bar. You get over to that slideshow, I think. Well, that's a slideshow. Oh, yeah. Oh. Is that working for you guys? My computer's frozen. Uh, it looks frozen on our end, too. Oh, um, oh there we go. Uh, it's working okay. now. Good. good. Okay. If it's just slower, if it's actually not moving. Oh, there we go. Okay. Sorry. So these are the targets from the plan we have right now. Um, and we're going to be specifically looking at 2050. So obviously we need the targets for all of them, but just kind of looking at that end goal target to really, um, see how we do the mix and then we can go back to 2035 and 2025. Um, so the things that we kind of noticed immediately as problems, biodigesters are not included as one of uh, the generation types um, and wind is relatively high for something that is not, that we don't um, consider possible as far as commercial wind. So still small wind is allowed, but that's, you know, a pretty high target for um, small wind. So kind of going from there, um, these are these are our very broad overviews of how we ended up getting our numbers. And actually, it might be helpful. I'm going to show what we ended up coming to first, and then we can backtrack to um, the um, calculations that might just kind of give a better view. But so, so these are um, in megawatts, the goals that we had or have, I guess, currently in our 2017 plan. And then in our 2023, this is kind of our proposed. Um, and it's, it's, you know, worth noting the change in number is in large part because we have added significant generation, mostly through solar. And so that solar number you see comes way down. And a big portion of that is because of the added generation that we've already done. So, you know, that feels really great to have this chunk taken out of it. Um, but, but we shifted to make um, hydro and wind feel a little more um, realistic and then also added in biodigesters because that's something that um, hey, you know, Marlena, can I just verify what I think you said? And that is that the 68.4 difference between the solar target in 2017 for 2050 and the 2023 target for 2050 is because that 68.4 was put in place already. It, it's it's there, and that's why the target is lower now, because that's actually generation of 68.4 megawatts or something near that that's been permitted or actually installed. Is that what you're saying? Correct. 
Yeah, and it's not one hundred percent. Sorry, I'd like to ask you another way. What is this the target for additional growth between twenty three and fifty, or is this yeah. a new total target for twenty fifty? No, these are new, and Look, and that's I, I don't know how to I don't know how to digest a target of new growth when I don't know what we started from and where we're at. And I, I need to see more numbers instead of just this one piece of that. That might just be if you had a target for 2050, <laughs> what it is, and then how far we are from that target at these different dates. So like in 2017, we were this far from the 2050 target at 2023, we're this far from it. And we've actually changed the mix because we don't do as much wind in our region. And because we do have more biodigestion and we do have more solar. Yeah, and so I just pulled up for reference our current generation capacity amongst all renewables in the region is um, 91 megawatts. Um, something else that we didn't reflect here because it gets the numbers get kind of confusing is that when you move the megawatt, the actual TART modeling that the state used is based on the megawatt hours and different resources have different megawatt hour capacity. For example, solar only works if there's sun. So in the winter, the megawatt hour capacity of solar goes way down. Um, so it's not like you move one um, megawatt from say uh, solar to a biodigester and it's exactly the same. The biodigester is more efficient on the whole because it can run year round, for example, whereas solar can only run for limited hours. So that adds to some of that complexity yeah and and those are all numbers that will absolutely come into play as we develop these targets this is kind of a snapshot piece because that megawatt hour <laughs> consideration makes it very confusing going from this to the total amount and the targets and the percentage so yes point taken bob absolutely i mean i think that's very crucial is to know um total amount needed where we are and that will come. This is, um, you know, really supposed to serve as like a gut check somewhat of like, does this feel like a, you know, reasonable road to kind of go down with our targets? And I can go back up because this will kind of- Before you do Marlena, um, yeah. I've got two questions on those totals. Whose targets are they? And number two, the totals indicate a decrease from 238 megawatt hours total to 148, which is a huge decrease. How much of that is due to six years of meeting those targets and therefore achieving part of those goals? And how much of it is just due to revised uh, overall perspectives on where we'll be? Let's not get too bogged down in the details right now. Let's go back to the earlier slides uh, to see, hear what you have to say on those, Marina. Okay. Um, so these are kind of our general calculations when we were looking at um, splitting up again, like, okay, so we need to meet this much generation. How do we want that to look? Um, it, Obviously, in, in all of these hydro, wind, solar, biodigesters, the um, output and size can vary greatly, but we try to do kind of an average of like, and for hydro, we were looking at, you know, traditional hydro has kind of new development has, you know, halted. That's not even relicensing our dams is becoming, you know, very complicated. Um, but run of the river systems are, you know, there are run of the river systems moving forward and that are um, proving to be very successful. And so kind of um, assuming any going forward would be run of the river systems, roughly around um, 100 kilowatts. And then 
looking at roughly 30 of those. Um, and there's a state calculation for um, how many kilowatts we could add um, on top of existing dams, basically through improvements or expansions. Um, and we did our percentage of that, which ends up being around 750. Um, so we landed on around four megawatts as kind of a um, rough estimate for what that could look like and what maybe we should be aiming for. Yeah. for hydro. This is the kind of language and presentation I think our regional energy plan can benefit from for the readers. This this is good. Obviously, you need to dis define what a run of the river hydro is because not everybody understands, but this is really nice. I appreciate what you 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 two are doing here. We tried to make it relatively readable. <laughs> um, and so then, you know, doing the same thing with biodigesters. And there's, it's so tough with the technology advancing as quickly as it is. Um, but the kind of current assessment for biodigesters is a farm of 500 or more cows. And so looking at that, we have 19 of them in our region, um, looking at the average output. And then you know, taking that 2.85 down to two with the assumption that not every farm is going to implement this to the full extent. Um, so two kilowatts feels like two megawatts, right? Yeah, two megawatts, sorry, that should say megawatts. Um, feels like a, you know, relatively reasonable um, goal for biodigesters. Um, and then wind, Again, not commercial height. We're talking, you know, smaller. Um, and the average output of that is 25 kilowatts. And then usually sites would have a couple of those. Um, and coming back again to two megawatts. And, and you know, I, I, I want to try to reflect on some of the experience that we're having in our uh, project review committee in that we're trying to apply the regional plan that describes, for example, um, wind, what we are um, incorporating as good in our regional plan and what we're saying is not. In many cases, what we are describing is appropriate for the rural nature of Franklin and Grand Isle County, in fact, of Vermont outside of Chittenden County, is that smaller is more likely to be acceptable to people. And that's where, if the state's serious about trying to get hydro, wind, solar, and um, biodigestion and other energy sources that they look at how to bring industries up in Vermont that develop what I'll call micro solar, micro wind. You know, we're not New York State, New York City. We are very low population density, mostly rural, many thousands more trees than people. And we need to just recognize that in not just the plans that we write, but also the economic incentives that we develop, the technologies we develop, the work uh, people, the, 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 the skilled labor that we develop, the educational foundations in our technical colleges. These are the things I think we should really try to build into our regional energy plan it's it's realistic it's vermont it's not trying to make what could be used in illinois in vermont this we're a unique place we just add yeah. to that Bill. i think we ought to also look to other countries and what they're doing because i'm sure in europe particularly in the northern countries that they have smaller systems that work within very small communities we should capture some of those and bring them here. Um, at least try them here, you know, and see if they work. Absolutely. And that's actually 
you hit the nail on the head as far as biodigesters. They're being developed in Europe in really micro scales. Um, and that technology is slowly starting to kind of come over and farms over here are starting to be able to use that. And I think, Bill, to your point, like that really is what we were looking at with all of these things is like relatively small biodigesters, relatively small wind, relatively small hydro. Those are the things that, you know, ring true to um, the region, basically, and what's possible and what's desired. And so I think you're absolutely right, too, that the context of that, of like, not just two megawatts, but where are we assuming that two megawatt, you know, will come from, I think is, could really help to alleviate some of that feeling of like, these are not realistic and they're not built for us. And this yeah, is you kind get of a hundred megawatt, a hundred kilowatt sites and you get your two megawatt. So, you know, you just build it by numbers, multiplying it out, not by trying to be industrial scale. Absolutely. Uh, well, uh, I, I, the wind piece, I actually have a problem with saying it's, it's up to four turbines. What I thought we had in mind when we wrote the last energy plan is when we, when we were thinking a small wind, we were actually thinking uh, a residential wind or a personal farm wind. We weren't thinking a wind farm. We were thinking a single turbine of 25, not four or more or even two to four. We were really thinking this was going to be a single power, not multiple powers. Uh, originally, at least in my mind, originally, I thought. for those of you who were on, on the committee at that stage, I'm not sure if your vision was like mine, but we, we were not expecting any kind of wind farm. Um, and, and so you're saying here four is actually more than what we had in mind originally. Yeah, Bob, I appreciate you bringing that up. And again, this is from our experience with uh, project review, we have in our regional plan, the goal of particular height, but we also think that the number of individual wind turbines can become industrial looking, even when they are of a shorter height. So we might want to revisit this because it, again, sort of is maybe appropriate if you have a community wind project, like there are community solar projects, solar projects, because there you get a big, let's say two megawatt or even 20 megawatt solar project and the whole community can benefit from it. You, you wouldn't put that for one home, but for a, a wind turbine, you could put up one relatively short uh, tower with a wind turbine on it that meets our 100 foot restriction, and it could power that whole farm. And it's a it's a big farm. It's, it's a farm that's doing a lot of electric usage. Those are the kinds of developments we think are good for Franklin and Grand Isle County. So this is something we should talk about in a combined conversation of project review and the energy um, planning process that we have here is how many turbines do we think we want to include as a part of our planning? Because it, what, what we're hearing is whenever you go over one, it creates the image that a lot of people don't want in Vermont which I always equate to, we don't have um, what are those uh, boards that you see out on the highways where you're driving in Southern billboards? state billboards. Yes, we don't have billboards in Vermont. They're against the law. I, I think a lot of people in Vermont but... think of two wind turbines as as aesthetically unpleasing as a billboard. Um, so I just wanted to share that. And Bob, thanks for reminding that that's where we need to get these two planning processes, regional project review and energy on the same plane. Marlena? Yeah, absolutely. And this is, again, not a directive. I mean, the, the two to four was simply part of the calculation of what might happen. It, it could also be assuming sites 
will house one turbine and it's, you know, don't make me do the math, 120, you, you know, like that, that could still be the calculation. Um, and this was, you know, really to get kind of a relatively reasonable target. It's far from a prescriptive, you know, list of what should or is going to be. Um, well, yeah. I, yep. I have some possible homework or you probably could delegate it back to me. But if you drive on 105 towards Enosburg, um, mm -hmm. by the old, um, just before you get to the old, um, I think it was Girl Scout camp, there's a big curb. A lot of people have accidents there. There's a big curb in the route road and it heads towards the northeast. There's a and there's a road that goes off. I'm not sure where it goes off anymore, but there's a road with three um windmills. Very yes. small, but they power that farm. Mm -hmm. well, I can go out and take pictures of that, but I'd be curious to know if I I don't know if I had could probably knock on the farmer's door and ask about things. But to me, I need something more visual and understand how much that was three turbines produce. And mm -hmm. also there's a, a farmer that and going on Route 7, just before you get to the um, um, Blakely Road intersection uh, in Colchester, driving south from exit 17 to uh, Blakely Road, there's another very small farm who just has one, uh, I would say less, maybe 75 feet tall windmill. And he's su supplying a whole lot of electricity to his greenhouse and his house. So again, and, and it's not, for me, it's never disruptive. I like looking at the thing turn, make sure we got wind <laughs> as I drive by at 40 miles an hour. Um, but there are some examples there that, to Bill's point, I'd like to learn more about uh, what we're talking about. Absolutely. I, I'm i honestly very curious too. I don't know what those ones produce. And they used to drive by them every day. Uh, those owls yeah. was one on five they're somewhere between 75 and 100 feet tall and i believe those are around 25 megawatts it's a small relatively small output um and i would consider those you know small farm kind of scale or farm scale the ones okay. that have been proposed for project review is four towers at 100 feet tall close to 100 megawatts each um because of the size of the turbines. So they're, they're actually very large turbines, much larger turbines than those ones on that farm. And the reason he feels that they meet our plan is because they're less than 100 feet tall, because that's the only limit we put on it. Right. But, but they're I, commercial, I, I they're kind of commercial out. grade at 100 feet. Okay, but I thought your point was to try to push non-commercial grade. Yes, my point is the ones on the farm are great. It's, it's like yeah, okay. old traditional farm with a windmill. Okay, yeah, so what I, I'm saying, I like the idea of, of showing people pictures of them and saying, here's here's a picture of a wind turbine with a silo, a couple of barns and the farmhouse. This is Franklin and Grand Isle County, Vermont. That's that's what we like here. That's what we want to have. Take your other stuff to another place. But it looks like Peter's been trying to get a comment in. I've got two off the wall, an off the wall irrelevant question and then a comment and then I'm going to shut up. The the um, question, well, the comment is, I guess they're both comments. A lot of um, renewables, including solar and wind, the environmental impact is very geographic de dependent. And I've always wondered why we have such a focus on our state boundaries in deciding where to is appropriate to develop it. For example, I was the lawyer permitting the Lowell Wind Project. And I would suggest that the environmental impact per megawatt of that is multiples the environmental impact of the two um, upland New York, um, northern New York wind farms, where they're on these sloping upgrades in the St. Lawrence Valley, and there's plenty of room. and yeah, there's some space needed on the PV20 that'll probably be expensive, but why we have such a almost fetish of having all of the renewables declared in our backyard. I know we can't do anything about it, but that's just a question. My other comment is, Marlena, it would be helpful, and sometimes it's impossible, 
to provide us with some of these materials in advance so we can be more informed um, on, on them. Uh, maybe they were um, uh, given advance and I just missed them, but I always feel more comfortable when I've seen things in advance. Uh, and then finally, I'm going to say that uh, I had a hip replacement surgery yesterday. I had two and a half hours of sleep. So I'm going to sign off. Hope you feel yes. better soon. <laughs> Please go get some rest. And yeah, yeah I, I didn't send the presentation ahead because I thought it might just be confusing without the conversation around it. Um, but absolutely. Um and well, it's just my perspective. Others may disagree. Well, you take care, Peter. Yeah. That's a lot to go through. Wow. Right. We'll see you later. All right. Take care. And so this is solar. And for solar, we really didn't do any calculations as far as creating the target other than subtracting the other ones. Um, because solar does make up kind of the the mass of the development we've seen and the the mass of the targets generally um and it still fits within our amount of um available land for it so you know it's not unrealistic it's not impossible um yeah i'm i'm curious so how I, I have a question is it possible for us to characterize the solar when it is put on existing structures. For example, there's there's more projects now that I'm seeing, whether in our region or maybe it's just in the news from outside of Franklin and Grand Isle counties, where solar is a part of the overall project. For example, my health department is moving to Waterbury and the new Waterbury building I'm going into, the whole roof is covered in solar. I would like to try to encourage more roof-based solar, especially on industrial facilities. And uh, I know that there are pro programs for doing that at public service and uh, within the overall goals of the Utility Commission. But I I'd like to try to do that more here in Vermont too. A lot of barns could probably have solar on them and it would not decrease the agricultural land that's available. But um, I just wondered if there was any data on the, not only on buildings, but if there's a breakdown also on some of the other preferred target areas. When we made the maps years ago, there was language about preferred areas like um, brownfields or um, quarries. quarries, yeah, or other kinds of facilities that have limited usage afterward and that these would be really good for. It, it, that might be something for us to focus on too, 